At MIT, one of the questions that we hear all the time is, what's in the box? The answer to that question is actually very simple. Uh, in the box, you'll find passive electronics, inductors, capacitors, resistors. Uh, a better question to ask, though, is actually, what does all that stuff that's in the box do? Well, to have that discussion, uh, we need to talk about uh, the nature of cables. Uh, cables tend to sound differently from one another for various reasons. Um, one of the most important ones is uh, how the cable stores and releases energy at different frequencies. Uh, we call this at MIT articulation. Now we define articulation as the magnitude of energy stored in the cable versus the attack or rise time and the decay or settling time of the energy that was, that was stored in the cable. And uh, we can take those measurements at different frequencies and we can plot a line along the audio bandwidth and we call that the articulation response of the cable. Uh, every cable, uh, no matter the manufacturer, will have a, uh, a point along the audio bandwidth where it articulates properly. It, it's doing the best job that it can do. Uh, and then they will roll off from there in the high frequencies and in the low frequencies. Uh, and what we've discovered is that uh, we can change the, that point along the audio bandwidth in which the cable articulates properly by changing the way we build the cable. We can uh, use different metallurgy, we can wind it differently, uh, we can use different insulators and dielectrics, we can uh, use different connectors. And all of those things contribute to uh, the cable's uh, best pull of articulation. Now, uh, in order for us at MIT, which our goal is to make it so the cable not only articulates in one area very well, but that it articulates along the entire bandwidth very, very well. And in order to, to do that, we had to uh, look at the cable in a completely different manner than, uh, than what others had been and continue to do. Um, First of all, we identified a cable for what it is. Uh, the very nature of a cable is it is a network. Uh, every cable has ports, it has terminals, it has uh, capacitance and inductance. Uh, it, it, it is a network. And so in looking at it in that light, uh, we can now say to ourselves, you know, if I add another network, alongside of, of this network that is optimized for a different frequency range, well then all of a sudden we now have a cable that is twice as good at doing its job of transporting from our energy from point A to point B. Uh, at MIT Cables we call this multipole technology. Now once we were ab able to perfect the art of adding multiple poles of articulation alongside in parallel to the main conductors of the cable, we then started to ask ourselves, well, we've got this ability to do this. Now, where should we put those articulation poles? So naturally, we turned to music theory to guide us to those frequencies that were the most pleasant to the human ear. Human ears tend to group harmonically related frequencies into a single sensation. Rather than preserving the individual components of a musical tone, we perceive them together and refer to this experience as timbre. Timbre describes all of the aspects of a musical sound which are mathematically related to the main note and is what makes one instrument sound different from another, even when they're playing the same note, duration, and volume. Imagine two musicians playing a flute and an oboe simultaneously and at the same duration and volume. You could easily distinguish the two instruments. The difference is in the timbre of the sounds. There are many words we use to describe timbre. Brassy, clear, unfocused, breathy, warm, bright. Some of these words are interchangeable and some have different meanings to different people. 
So we make no effort to define them. Instead, at MIT, we focus on the mathematical relationships between each component of timbre. If you were to listen carefully as you pluck a string on a guitar, you would not only hear the vibration of the main note, but a variety of other vibrations which are mathematically related. These vibrations are known as the fundamental, harmonics, overtones, and inharmonics. Let's take a look at each of these components in depth. The fundamental frequency is the vibration that has the slowest rate and is the loudest. It is the frequency at which the entire complex sound wave vibrates. It is also known as the tonic, or more simply, the main note. A harmonic is a frequency that is an integer multiple of the fundamental. To find the harmonic, simply multiply the fundamental by whole numbers ascending from 1. For example, if the fundamental is 25 Hz, the first harmonic is 25 Hz. The second is 50 Hz, the third is 75 Hz, the fourth is 100 Hz, and so on. An overtone is commonly confused with a harmonic. The difference is that an overtone is not a whole number multiple of the fundamental, though it is always greater than one. Subjectively, some people may enjoy listening to music that is rich in overtones. Alternately, others may find overtone rich music to be fatiguing. An inharmonic is similar to an overtone. However, unlike an overtone which is always a multiple equal to or greater than one times the fundamental, inharmonics are always a multiple less than one times the fundamental. Be careful not to confuse inharmonics with inharmonicity, which refers to the degree to which an overtone departs from whole multiples of the fundamental. An octave is an interval between a fundamental tone and another that is half or double its frequency. For example, if you play the middle C note on a piano keyboard, it will vibrate at roughly 261.5 Hz. Moving up the piano keyboard, the octave of middle C is double that, 523 Hz. An interval simply refers to a space between two notes or frequencies. Intervals are used by musicians to make pleasing sounds by playing two or more mathematically related notes at the same time within the space of an octave called chords. Notes with simple numerical relationships sound the most pleasing. For example, if you multiply a fundamental of 440 Hz, which is an A, by 1.2, or a ratio of 5 to 6, you get 528 Hz, or C. If you then take the same fundamental and multiply it by 1.5, a ratio of 2 to 3, you get 660 Hz, or E. Now if you play A, C, and E together, you'll find that it sounds quite nice. These are called consonant intervals. Conversely, if you multiply your fundamental by more complex ratios, the sounds become more and more dissonant. Now that we've gone through some of the important aspects of music theory, uh, let's take a look at how MIT Cables employs this knowledge to design our interfaces. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that uh, MIT's design criteria only deals with fundamentals, octaves, harmonics, inharmonics, and intervals. Uh, and all the math that we use in our designs only recognizes whole numbers or intervals that stem from simple numbers, uh, 1 to 10. Uh, and why? Uh, well, because it's a linear model and because the interface shouldn't change uh, the harmonics, the overtones, the inharmonics of the music. So by understanding the mathematical relationship of a complex musical event, we're able to develop technologies that preserve the natural harmonic structure of the audio, which then preserves the timbre. Uh, to see how this is done, let's break down a musical tone. Here's what we call a pure tone or sine wave. It's just a fundamental. This tone doesn't actually exist in nature. It only exists on a scientist's test bench as a synthesized tone. Now this is a complex tone consisting of the fundamental and three harmonics. It takes at least three harmonics for the human ear to identify a complex tone. But rigorous research at MIT over the past decade or so has shown us that while the human ear only needs three harmonics to identify a complex tone, an audiophile actually requires seven or more harmonics to be satisfied with its density. This is why at MIT we take into consideration the first seven to ten harmonics of each musical event in the design of our interfaces. What's important to note here 
is that neither the magnitude nor the space or distance between the mathematically related components of the complex tone or audio signal can be changed. If they are, the timbre of the complex tone is changed and will no longer be faithfully reproduced during playback. So for example, uh, say the cable removes the third harmonic. What happens to the stored energy there? It simply can't vanish. What happens is the energy is moved to areas that are not connected uh, to the fundamental by simple math and it reappears as overtones. In this example, they're placed between the fourth and fifth and the fifth and sixth harmonics. Some people may consider this tone pleasing to listen to, but what happened to accuracy? This tone is no longer faithful to the original musical event. What was once a true C sharp now could be closer to a D, for example. Now that we have an understanding of harmonics and overtones, and how a cable might change the timbre of the music passing through it, let's go back to articulation. Here we have an articulation response graph for a well-known high-end eight-foot pair of speaker cables built with high-quality materials, Teflon and high-quality copper. What we're going to do is superimpose a dynamic bar graph that will show the dynamics of how the cable stores and releases energy. The bars represent poles of articulation. Let's take a look at the graph and try to understand it. The vertical axis is scaled in percent of articulation. Ideal articulation is being represented as 50% on this graph. The horizontal axis is scaled in hertz from 0 to 45 kilohertz. For reference, we've also included the piano range, which is 27.5 hertz, which is an A, to 4,186 hertz, which is a C. And we've also identified several of the important notes on the piano keyboard, middle C, A440. Also shown is the generally accepted range of the human ear, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Middle C is important because it is a reference point for musicians, and A440 is important because it's the tuning frequency for large orchestras. As the music signal enters the cable, the cable charges and we see a response. In this cable, it's plain to see that in the low frequencies, roughly 10 hertz to 110 hertz, the cable is under-articulating. This means that the musical energy within this frequency range is not storing or charging as quickly as the music energy in the higher frequencies. This causes a muddiness in the bass region here. Uh, this area will also have uh, its image and sound stage disconnected from the rest of the music. Remember that articulation is defined as the magnitude of energy stored within the cable versus the attack or rise time and decay or settling time of the energy that has been stored within the cable. Notice that within the frequency range of 200 Hz to 1760 Hz, the music is articulating ideally to 50%. Nothing above, nothing below. Within the next band of frequencies, 3.52 kHz to 11.3 kHz, the cable is over-articulating because it is rising above the 50% line. This causes the cable to ring up in this frequency range. This will add a pronounced hardness in the range. And this area will also become disconnected from the other parts of the music, uh, just like the lower frequencies were. Ringing causes a bloating of the image, which can result in the image being scaled too large for the sound stage. Now, above 11.3 kilohertz, the cable once again is articulating ideally. In this cable, note that the image and sound stage are rendered differently in four separate areas, three of which are of grave concern. Uh, causing them to be disconnected from one another. Many people in the industry have described this particular cable as revealing in the mid-range. If we look carefully, we can see why. Uh, the articulation response shows this cable to be operating really well within the 200 hertz to almost 3.5 kilohertz area, solidly in the mid-range. As the musical energy is transported through the cable, we can see the area in the mid-range which charged ideally has also settled out ideally, leaving no energy behind. In the low frequencies, however, this hasn't happened. Uh, because the cable charged too slowly, it still hasn't settled out yet. Therefore, there is still latent music energy left in the cable. Also, in the high frequencies where it over-articulated or rang up, now it is ringing down, leaving again, latent musical energy behind. If this cable were energized at this point, the output terminals of the cable would not be reliant solely on the stimulation of the new musical signal present at the input terminals. 
the energy that's been left behind in the cable in these frequency spans would therefore contaminate the next musical signal. Remember when I said earlier that an audio cable by its very nature is a network? Let's talk about that a little bit more before we go on. All audio signal carrying cables or interfaces can be viewed as a four terminal two port network. A network port consists of two electrical terminals. This of course also means that a two port network has two accessible pairs of electrical terminals or four terminals in total. One of these terminal pairs is the input port to which a known signal voltage or current is applied. In an audio system the voltages and currents are the musical signal. The input port is usually connected to the source with its two terminals. The cable or interface transports this input stimulus to produce a response at the second of the two terminal pairs which is called the output port. Usually the output port is connected to the load with its two terminals. For an audio signal cable to be considered linear, the cable must transport the musical signal in the following manner. At any point or instant in time, the output response of the second port must only be related to the signal stimulating the input port. Again, in an audio signal carrying cable, the stimulus signal is the music signal. Getting back to the example we just looked at, the cable or network is obviously not linear because the output response is not completely and solely related to the music stimulating the input terminals. Now let's take a look at an 8-foot Oracle speaker cable from MIT. As the musical signal enters the cable, all of the articulation poles from 22.5 Hz to 45 kilohertz are articulating ideally. There's no ringing up, no ringing down. Therefore, there's no latency present in the cable. As the music signal decays, it settles out completely before the next musical signal stimulates the cable. This means it's linear. I started this video repeating the question, what's in the box? A question we get all the time here at MIT. And like I said, uh, the box is full of passive and parallel components, resistors, inductors, capacitors. But it's what these components do that's most important. Audiophiles have been interfacing their components and loudspeakers with MIT cables for decades with Oracle speaker cables for the last 12 years. And why do they do this? They do it because they know that they don't want a cable that contaminates the music. Speaking in generalities, audiophiles don't want this because the timbre or tonality in the low frequencies is what audiophiles would call um, lacking in detail, muddy, slow, uh, thick, in this cable, below 220 hertz, uh, it, the system won't image properly. So the image in these low frequencies uh, will be completely disconnected from the most important frequency range, the mid-range, right around 440 hertz. Uh, the sound stage in, in the low frequencies, rather than being high, wide, and deep, will be low, narrow, and shallow. Uh, lacking separation, lacking detail, lacking clarity. Uh, looking at the high frequencies above uh, 1.7 uh, kilohertz, uh, the timbre here will be what audiophiles would call hard or overly etched, sibilant, um, bright. Uh, in this area, strings will sound shiny and raspy. And the image in this area will also be disconnected from the main body of the music, those mid-ranges from 220 hertz to 1.7 kilohertz. Uh, and that image uh, will be excessively wide, excessively tall, but it'll be thin. It won't have any depth. The scale of a soprano, for example, will have no chest, will have very little neck, but the head and mouth will be too large. And the sound stage in this frequency range, rather than being high, wide, and deep, will be scattered around, way too large, and its contents will be out of proportion from one another. Audiophiles do want this because the timbre will be correct. The system will image properly and in the proper scale. Uh, each area of the music will be connected to the others. The soundstage will be nice and three-dimensional, having height, width, depth, 
uh, reaching in front of the loudspeakers with no disproportion of the images inside it. This is why discerning audio files have been using MIT cables in their systems for so long. And that's why we say at MIT, we make more than just cables.